So we'll open the floor now for questions as we have after each of the plenaries. Um, I think this was a provocative enough presentation that we don't have to talk among ourselves to develop questions. I could probably ask questions for the next hour, but I won't do that. I'll just give the mic to people who are interested and we'll proceed. Hi, and thank you. Um, you touched on a very important point, and that's the um, importance of eroding the dominant paradigm, right, mm. in order to make it any significant headway. Mm. And I think that's a really important point to touch on. So my question is related to that. Yep. Um, just as an, <clears throat> as an example, I have a cousin who just graduated uh, with a degree in corporate finance from Wharton. I'm sorry. And yes, and I uh, I just went to his college graduation, which, which yeah. was quite the affair, and um, you know so I'm uh, wondering if you have any comments on so obviously there's still these pr prominent uh, schools in the U.S. churning out these minions of the old dominant, mm. it's not really old, the dominant paradigm, right? Mm. So I'm wondering if you have any reflections on that or, or if you, particularly if you see any developments um, in academic institutions like Wharton or other examples where they yeah. might have been making some changes in their curricula since the financial collapse and whether or not you see any developments in academic institutions that are creating um, schools uh, that present some alternative economic yeah. paradigms. No, it's, it's a great point. The um, so I have an MBA, in addition to being a derivatives person. Um, <clears throat> and I do know that, and I do a fair amount of talks at business schools. And usually I come in the back door and not escorted by a finance professor. Um, and it's a real problem. Uh, business schools, by and large, will, you know, the, the professors in the business schools will tell you that the finance departments run the show. Um, uh, they'll say that privately, if not publicly. And to be honest, the finance professors are, um, by and large, uh, th it's not that they're not smart, they're very smart, but they're the least connected to this conversation of anyone in the business schools. And many of them sort of s s turn their heads up at it or snuff at it, or whatever the right term is. Uh, however, there is some positive news. Um, and, and just in my own little world of pecking away at this, well, first of all, there are some sustainable business programs like um, Bard College just started one, um, uh, Bainbridge Institute has an excellent sustainable MBA. Uh, many of them are not particularly deep on the finance issues, um, but at least that's progress. But most interestingly to me um, is that there, there are a few finance professors that get it. There's one at Fordham, there's one at University of Michigan, and the, the one at Fordham has invited me to participate in a panel at uh, two upcoming conferences, and I forget the formal names, but they're the industry groups for management professors this summer in Orlando, and, uh, and another one for finance professors in the fall. And, uh, and our topic is, you know, right between the eyes, this kind of stuff. And that was not only, you know, not only did we get invited, but apparently, you know, with great enthusiasm. So, you know, Slowly but surely, I think there's the beginnings of some, some progress, but that doesn't at all affect the MBA degrees and the economics degrees that all of our kids are, are getting. And my daughter's you know, an undergraduate at Duke right now and just took econ, and of course, the professor laughed at her when she put her hand up and said, what if you can't grow the economy forever? Because you know, she learned something at home. <laughs> and uh, and he, he, literally, he literally ridiculed her. And I'm paying, you know how much I'm paying. <laughs> Hey John, it's Vanessa from One Earth, and um, thank you so much for this. This was excellent and Great. Uh, really ins uh, insightful. And one thing that that was um, uh, kind of aha moment for me was when you were talking about the investment piece, and then you said that really we need to get into the boardrooms and the private equity companies that yeah. are speaking to the the, the board. And so, kind of, kind of building on Janine's point. When we think about this paradigm shift, obviously some of those people are the people we need to engage with. Uh, what other tips do you have around that paradigm shift, particularly also from the sustainable consumption perspective, yeah. which we're focusing on? Uh, well, I think you personally and you all collectively probably have been thinking about this longer than I have. Um, 
so I'm not sure I have any 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 incremental tips um, um, to share. I, I so this this is where I get to this idea of regenerative economy, and. <clears throat> How many people are familiar with the term regenerative in the sense of economics, not, not just the word? I, I mean, I, I'll make a prediction. I think this is going to be a meme that sticks. Sustainability is a meme, but we don't really know what it means, and we've bastardized it and whatnot. Um, but in the built environment community, buildings, architects, they're hot on the trail and, and doing really interesting work around this idea of a, of a regenerative paradigm. And again, it's a, it's a subject of a whole talk. But I think, for, for me personally, that was the shift. And, it, and it's this idea that you know, there is this thing called entropy. And we're, <clears throat> we're alive today and breathing because we have in ourselves the ability to, um, uh, to stay alive and regenerate despite this, this, this you know, march of entropy. And somehow, you know, using that um, ecological or, or um, kind of an ecological worldview, we need to have the economic system operate in that regenerative capacity. And obviously, um, uh, not, not burning fossil fuels is a critical component of that. But there are many other examples, um, and and I don't I don't really have time to. I'd love to tell the stories, but I don't think it's the right time to do it. But um, but but watch our website. We're going to be putting more material out on that. So. Regenerative economy, re regenerative capitalism. You know, redefine capital. Capital is not money. Capital has all, they're all, the, the permaculture community has come up with eight forms of capital. Um, and imagine a capitalist system that built that kind of wealth and harmonized those different forms of wealth as the core DNA of the system. Um, th those are the kind of ideas that I'm working on at least. Vesel Veleva, UMass Boston College of Management. I would like to thank you for an excellent presentation. I can relate to so many of the things you discussed because I work in the social responsible field. I teach in a college of management. I was before in Boston College. And uh, I have two questions, but before that I wanted to completely agree with you that finance and accounting professors are the most difficult to get on board. <laughs> we lead a new mass bus, but it's a management and marketing department, so we have sustainability programs and training, but it's still yeah. hard to get the finance and accounting on board. Yeah. So I have two questions, and the first relates to the investment myopia. Mm. We know that this quarterly earnings are a real problem. Mm. Um, we tend to think the public companies are the evils, but in fact they are driven by the system they're mm. operating in. And we know that Unilever decided we're just not going to report on quarterly basis because this focus on quarterly earning is destroying long-term value. Yep. So do you see any hope in this direction that this may change? Um, and the <coughs> second relates to what individuals like us can do with our investment decisions. And again, mm. unfortunately, because we all don't like to pay taxes, so we try to invest in our retirement accounts for one, for three. Um, and is there any way that we can impact, we can be part of this impact investment, but still yeah. take advantage of the you know, tax benefits? Yeah. Great question. So on, I should have mentioned, there's also some hope on the accounting front. Uh, in the US, there's an organization called the SASB, uh, a little play on FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. This is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And they're making real fast progress uh, on trying to embed you know, ESG metrics, if you will, in our core accounting. Um, so there is some progress there. Um, <coughs> on the, on the, um, the second question, what can, what can we all do? You know, the, remember the move your money um, uh, campaign that came out of uh, Occupy? I mean, I, I, I think it starts with, you know, where is your money? What bank are you doing business with? Um, it's very hard to unplug from a bank. And, um, and it's a pain. But, um, but one very tangible and, and relatively concrete step we can all take is to be very conscious about and intentional about where we bank. And, and do the research in your area about whether it's a co-op or a local bank or, um, or what have you. And, and there, are, there are websites now that will help with, with doing that. Um, 401ks is, is trickier because your, your choices are limited. And, and candidly, um, I, I think I can use the term suck. Your, your, your choices suck. And, um, 
And so you can do something that feels a little less bad than something else, but you have to make a fundamental decision about whether you want to be invested in the public security capital markets. And, and all the marketing and razzmatazz around the edges is, is trivial relative to the fundamental decision of do you want to be invested in public equity markets in a, in a world they were moving into some idea that some guy came up with called financial overshoot. And, and my only advice would be not to put all your eggs in that basket. Um, and I, I certainly don't. Um, I, I personally invest in public stocks only on a very intentional basis. I don't own, that's not true. I almost don't own any portfolios. I, I own some hedge fund investments that invest in portfolios of stocks. But by and large, you know, I don't own any diversified mutual funds. I make very intentional investment decisions when I invest in public equities. <clears throat> um, but there's not a good answer to that. I think, the, I think the best thing we can do is to take our money out of you know, the systems that aren't serving us and demand what we want. And you know, if markets actually work, there should be a response to that. But it's, it's complicated because aggregating enough capital to do this with enough economies of scale to be able to have a business out of it is, is a challenge. Um, but, um, but you know, the, there are hopeful signs of that. There are many um, uh, typically catering to high net worth individuals because it's easier to make a business out of that. But for example, RSF Social Finance is an organization I'm affiliated with and they do great work. They have a loan fund that only invests in, um, in the kind of businesses that we'd all want to support. Um, and in Europe, the, 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 you know, the, the poster child bank is, is um, Triodos Bank. And I'd encourage you to go to their website. It, it'll, it'll blow you away. And I forgot your first question. Oh, the quarterly thing. Uh, again, I, I think the, you know, you mentioned Unilever as an example. I think we need leadership out of corporate CEOs to just say no. And, and, and Paul Pullman has done that and others will follow. Um, there's a big initiative that Richard Branson is just launching called the B Team, and this is going to be a big focus of, of their work. Um, but but um, the current quarterly thing just simply doesn't work, and and trying to fight that, make that system work better, to me is is a losing battle. Um, we need to pull out of it and find a different path. Great, um, thank you, John. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the relationship between financialization and sustainability because it seems to me it's, I'm sort of not sure how these two things relate. I mean, we know financialization has all these bad consequences for the functioning of the economy and sort of unemployment, GDP growth and so forth, but um, what is its relationship to sustainability goals? For example, the financial crisis led to you know, the first decline in uh, greenhouse gas emissions because mm -hmm. of the contraction of output. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how you, are, how you think about that, because it is, I mean, the point you made is partially true, which is that it's a game among wealthy individuals with winners and losers. It has this impact on the real economy at times, I mean, sort of big impacts in terms of crashes. There's a question about its relationship to the flow of investment capital. So how does growing financialization affect the rate of growth of investment? And I really appreciate that you focus so much on that. And then what is the uh, impact of it on available investment, say, for clean energy? I mean, I've just been looking mm. at these numbers and they're confusing mm. because you've got real volatility right now in the amount, in the U.S. economy, in the amount of financing for real investment in um, clean energy technologies, which yeah. I'm wondering, you know, wh what you think is kind of driving that volatility and what's going on there. Um, because one view would be, admittedly a marginal one, that the, uh, the sort of bad economic impacts of financialization you know, creating so much economic devastation means that you've got these alternatives growing up in niches, uh, in, in sort of local areas, which are, the, are necessary for creating the models for the new paradigm. So in some mm. sense, maybe it's an enabling condition. Mm. I don't know. I'm just curious about your thoughts on it. 
Thanks, Julie. You know, leave it to Professor Shore to uh, <laughs> stick her finger right on the hard issue. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think, I think, fundamentally, the most important connection between financialization and the problem we're all here about is ideology. And I, I, I am reminded of the new, not so new anymore, commercial of the babies in the crib with the Schwab accounts trading. And I, I, think, I think at one base level, we've become accustomed to thinking that looking at our quarterly returns of our financial statements is sort of a judgment on whether we're good people and smart and clever or whether we're suckers and idiots. And so we're trained to be constantly worrying about the wrong stuff. You know, there's a, there's a TV show called Fast Money where you can spend all afternoon watching some idiots talking about individual stocks going up and down on an hourly basis. And so I, I, think, I think the biggest danger is that it's, it's, a, it's a massive distraction and has pulled us away from thinking more clearly about what investment means as opposed to what speculation is. Um, but, but there are some more direct connections and they are hard to articulate. Um, I, I think boom and bust cycles have been around forever. So we can't sort of blame boom and bust cycles on security, securitization and, and derivatives. But as my chart showed, it's accelerated tremendously recently. So we've, we've accelerated the boom and bust cycle, we've shortened it, and that's destabilizing and ultimately humans are only able to cope with so much volatility and instability in a given period of time before it erodes social fabric, trust, confidence and whatnot. So I think there's a, there's a feedback loop there. And then I think the third one is that, you know, I, I basically just think there's too much financial capital. The planet is this big, it's not growing, its, it's functions are being degraded, so it's actually shrinking in terms of its, its service to, quote unquote, service to we humans, and yet the pool of financial capital keeps growing. And, and it, in many ways, that's the issue. And so, um, you know, at a very basic level, we need to recycle financial capital back into natural capital. And as long as financialization keeps running, it makes that problem worse. And, and so the, all of that money is chasing returns and looking for somewhere to invest and doesn't look to alternative energy because the risk reward trade-off is not as good as, you know, my buddy who's investing in SAQC capital. And so um, until we, uh, until we, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very basic sort of moral decision. You know, what is it important, what is the purpose of capital? I, you know, I, I said that at a, that, that was sort of the question that got me on this whole journey. And, and, and financial returns is not the purpose of capital. Um, so I think, I think, I don't know if that helps at all, but that's the, that's the way I'm wrestling with the question. I have a, thank you for that very interesting talk. I have a question about something you mentioned off and on, but uh, specifically speculative investment mm. and its relationship to um, sustainability and kind of builds on what uh, Julie was saying. So Michael Goldman, who's a sociology professor at uh, the University of Minnesota, has done some really interesting work looking at how speculative investment cycles are uh, plugged into growth and also the growth of eco-cities, ghost towns in China and Abu Dhabi, and essentially how these elaborate capital flows are driving, for example, increase in floor space that you don't need in parts of the developing world. Mm. So I guess my question is, how much of a problem is speculative investment in terms of sustainability? Mm. Uh, in, in terms of percentages of, you know, is it something we should be worrying about and is it mm. something that's easy to deal with right now compared to, you know, a complete reworking of the system? Yeah. I got another great question. Um, you know, I, I've tried to write an answer to that question and I haven't come up with a good answer yet. Um, but here's what I believe. I, I think some amount of speculation is helpful. Um, certainly the guys who sit in the pits in Chicago and scream at each other all day are providing a useful social purpose in terms of creating liquidity and making markets flow. Uh, but that doesn't mean that a, since a little speculation is good, more is better. And so it's a, it's a question of scale and, and, and balance. Uh, that'd be the first thing. 
Um, I think you know this issue of boom and bust cycles, whether it's floor space in in the third world or uh, subprime mortgage loans or whatever, the more financial capital that's chasing speculative activity, th the more extreme these boom bust cycles are, and that has to be bad at some level, given the inability of society to respond to these 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 uh, earthquakes, if you will. Um, and, and then third, and this I think was Julie's point, the more capital that's di diverted into speculative activity, the less capital there is to invest in what we really need to invest in. So at, at the heart of it, that's why speculation is bad, excessive speculation, because, um, because we have such a huge need for investment in real activity that, uh, to transform the econ economic system. Um, so I think that's the heart of my argument and, and how to deal with it, you know, the, the, the financial transaction tax gets at this high frequency trading thing, which is totally um, bad. I mean, there are good things that it does, but basically it's organized, systematic, electronic, front running and insider trading. And it should be, it should be taxed away, it's, it'd be hard to ban, but it'd be easy to tax away. Um, but that only deals with the one element of speculation. That doesn't deal with the excessive building, you know, construction boom, so. The, the, I, I, uh, so at this conference, we are talking about how to achieve well-being and flourishing society while consuming less mm. materials, energy. And um, as I, as I listen to it, okay, so we have GDP of which se roughly 70% is in private consumption. Mm. And we're thinking about it, can we reduce this number and still have good life and well-being? But as I listened to you, I was thinking, what would happen, in, it's a naive question and hypothetical. Let's say this 70% gets reduced down to 50%, 45%, right? We really all just cut our consumption by a huge uh, amount. Would there be any ripple effect, any pressure on this out of control financial system that you are describing? Or would we just be getting used to being happy on a smaller scale and maybe survive the next total meltdown because we will get used to mm. living. I mean, is there mm. is that a potential agent of change? Um, I have to I have to think further about that. That's a, that's an interesting question. But I my my initial reaction is that um, the the financial shenanigans only. Um, my initial answer is no. I, I think the I think the financial the financial world operates in somewhat of a vacuum, and whether the economy is growing two percent or shrinking two percent, they have a game to play, and it's, it, it'll be there'll be different strategies and different tactics, but but they don't see the connection to the real world and the real economy that your question suggests might exist. And so it would change the game. Uh, there'd be a big crash. I mean, if, if, if U.S. consumption shrank by a big amount, there would be a financial crash. Um, that part I know. And, and there'd be chaos on Wall Street, and the Fed would bail out these big banks to save us. And I think the Fed bailed out these banks to save us, not to save the banks, uh, even though I don't like the way they did it. Um, and uh, and we'd, be, we'd be in a big, We'd be in a big mess again, um, but I'm not sure it would change the behavior of Wall Street. And and the, and you know that changing that ideology will come not through a reduce a reduction in consumption. I think that'd be my initial thought. But that doesn't mean you couldn't don't keep trying. <laughs> I know this, is the mic? Yes, sir. He, right. who, he who has the mic controls the room. <laughs> okay. First, thanks very much for uh, what I thought was really a, a, a wonderful presentation. Um, oh, sure. 
In The uh, <laughs> Economist last week, there was an article, The End of Poverty, that uh, outlined um, some of the success of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, in particular showing that um, over a 30-year, no, less than that, about a 20-year period, poverty, grinding poverty, where people were earning less than $30 a month, had been reduced from, in the developing world, from roughly 43% of the population to 21% of the population. Yeah. And that most of this was due to growth. Some of it was due to government policies that reallocated resources, but most of, most of it due to, due to growth. Um, now, on the one hand, I'm extremely sympathetic, obviously, because I'm here, with the kinds of things that you've presented. But on the other hand, you know, I spent most of my career in, in sub-Saharan Africa and saw some of that stuff. And, mm. and I would hate to see places like that, mm. South Asia, other parts of the world, Latin America, compromise to such a degree that 40 years from now, we're looking at the same percentages that exist today, um, yeah. existing then in the yeah. future. Now, do you see pathways out of this that are, you know, in some way taking care of this question of equity uh, and yet not growing in an unsustainable fashion? Yeah. No, thank you for asking that. I, I, I neglected to make my, my thoughts clear on this. To, to me, the, the moral imperative on the developed world is to create room for the underdeveloped world to grow, um, and, and hopefully in a more intelligent way than, than what we've done in, in the North. Um, I, I am suspicious of some of these statistics that The Economist is relying on. I mean, I, I, um, uh, you know, if, if someone moves from a rural village to a city, and I'm sure what's driving that is China, and to a lesser extent India, but mostly China, I'm not sure well-being is improved. I don't know, and I'm ignorant about this, but I'm not sure well-being is really improved when someone moves from a rural village to, you know, a factory where people are jumping out the window because they can't stand it. Um, but having said that, um, you know, the, the, uh, what, what I've seen in, in my little exposure to the third world is, is you know, a complete de disconnection with the, um, the, quote, global economy and the growth of the global economy. I was in India this December, and what I saw that was extremely inspiring in rural villages would not even show up on the global economy, you know, meter and I saw huge improvements in well-being in these villages compared to what they told me existed five years earlier so I think it's a really complex subject you know more about it than I do but but your your general point is that you know our challenge is much worse because we do need to morally create space for growth in uh, particularly the underdeveloped world yeah John Philip Vergaard um, I really understand that you are communicating with us a counter ideology against the, the dominant ideology. But my question is more about the political aspects of it. Mm. And you didn't really touch about it. In various ways, politics is about power. And we are, have, have very powerful institutions. So you need counter power to that. Politics is also about the governance system. And you, you hinted at it, but the governance system is about regulating the financial system, mm. or both on the national levels and on the global levels. And uh, that's what politics are for, right? To, and as, so I, I see it as, a, as an ideological problem, but I also see it very much as a political problem. Mm. And the third thing is that politics is about democracy and about us as, as citizens controlling the, the government. Now the government, as we all know here in this country, is captured by those big financial interests. Mm. So they don't function as a democracy anymore. But uh, we as citizens are informed in a way that our retirement funds are under threat if we don't grow and if the financial institutions are not healthy. 
Mm. So we don't vote. We get a very weak uh, Dodd Frank bill, um, uh, and that was even a big achievement in this country. Mm. So um, the, another task of the government is to inform the public transparently about what's going on. So I would like to touch you to touch on the political aspect mm. of this question. Thank you. So great, great question. Um, you know, I've chosen personally not to engage in that just because um, much because I, I find it so depressing and, and uh, impossible. And so you sort of, I, I have this analogy, there's this huge rock and we all sort of have to find a stool and pull up a chair and start chiseling where we think we can whack at it. So that's really the main reason. But, but I do believe that we'll never deal with the political until we shift the, the paradigm, the ideology. Because the, you know, many people say that you know, leaders look for a parade to jump in front of. And I, I think we won't figure out the right parade until we shift the, the uh, ideological framework. And so my work is very focused on the, the paradigm shift and, and as a way to deal with the politics. Because I've been to Washington, I, mean, I know, I can't even start a conversation with these folks about this. You know, it, I mean, you have, you have 30 minutes or, or an hour if you're lucky. You know, <laughs> I mean, where do you start? So, um, so that's, that's my... Answer, but obviously you're you're spot on. It, it's a there's a massive political issue here, and um, and it's worse than just solving politics in America the way we all know, because some of these issues require global governance and global decision making, and we see how horribly failed that is when we have nation states getting together. Um, that's again old paradigm thinking, as you know. <laughs> Finally. Uh, my question is about action. Uh, I'm curious to learn, you list the many um, recommendations of actions. Um, in particular for you, where you are in your institute, what action do you choose? Where do you see as high leverage point for intervention? And why do you choose it? What's your underlying theory of change yeah. for doing that? So that's one question. The second question is the interrelationship between what you're doing and this community of sustainable consumption and production. How might what you are doing uh, could be supported by us, this community, mm. and what we could be supported by what you're doing, if any thoughts on that. That's, that's great. I appreciate you asking that. I, you know, the theory of change question, I always hate that question, <laughs> probably because I don't have a good answer to it. Um, I, you know, I, I set up, the Kaplan Institute, by the way, is tiny. I mean, it's, it's, there's three people, and it collaborates with, with other groups like yours, and, and I'd love uh, to figure out how we can engage. You know, my, my theory of change is that this conversation needs a finance expert at the table and, and, and more than one. And so I created a little collaborative space to, cult, to nurture that um, thinking in order to plug it into the broader collaborative conversations. And, and Julie Shore has been a, a colleague in this sense for years. Um, you know, I've learned way more from those collaborative efforts than I have obviously sitting on my own, but also talking within the financial world. Um, the, the people that are dealing with sustainable finance, I don't know if this is being recorded, but by and large are, are um, not, not without exception, but by and large are not where I'm getting my cutting edge thinking. The, the, you know, I mentioned earlier the regenerative design world. Um, you know, Alan Savory is a man who, who figured out how to use cattle to mimic nature using this idea of holism. Um, you know, those are where these ideas, those are where my thinking come from. So I'm, I'm all about reaching out and collaborating with people from outside my field and trying to add my expertise to it. Um, uh, in, in terms of theory of change, I'd have to say that, you know, at one level, my theory of change is that if we don't transform finance, the rest of it's not going to happen. So that's why it's important to focus on finance and how to transform finance and the whole system. My theory of change would be, you know, this is borrowing from Dana Meadows, the, the leverage point is the paradigm. And so I spend a lot of time wrestling with and thinking about what the right paradigm is or the next paradigm is and how we can, how we can move our, ourselves toward that. Um. Thank you for your qualified optimism. Uh, it's kind of uh, refreshing. Um, I've, got, I've had some involvement with Slow Money, hmm. Kiva, 
both of which are organizations that are trying to kind of rebuild a financial What was the second one? Kiva. It's oh, Kiva, a Kiva, yeah. micro lending yeah. uh, organization. And uh, I just wonder what you think the potentials are for yeah. groups like Slow Money. So uh, when I, I, I like to say I, when I came in from the cold uh, was when I first went to an investor circle conference and met Woody Tash and the community there and, and, um, and so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Woody, he's taught me a lot um, and uh, I was actually just at the Slow Money conference um, this year out in Boulder and I think it's a piece of the, it, it is in many ways ground zero. Um, uh, I think Woody calls food ground zero of sustainability and so I, and I, believe, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of the green sprouts that have to happen, but it's, it's not, it's not going to fix this. Um, and so, um, uh, I think it's, you know, I think, I don't think there's any silver bullets and, and certainly reinvesting and rethinking real investment in our food systems is, is a great place to start. It is a place, I should have mentioned it earlier, what can we do? It is a place where we can all get involved. Um, there's a, there's a terrific book out, um, that Carol, Carol, I can't think of her last name right now, wrote about real live practice of slow money activity happening on the ground. It's, it's a new book out. Um, and and she, she's this hustler, go-getter. A lot of that's happening in Massachusetts. There's, a, there's something um, called uh, the red tomato, or the red, the red tomato and the, sorry, the carrot project. Red tomato is something different. Uh, which is about financing small farms and, and in a way that individuals can get involved. Um, uh, that's, that's based in Boston. There's another arm of it out in the Berkshires. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kiva, I've, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer thing I've gotten less involved in directly, so I'm less knowledgeable about it. It's very intriguing. It scares me a little. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's hard to invest. It's hard to lend money prudently, intelligently, and it makes me a little nervous if someone has $100,000 of savings that they're going to start going around and making direct loans to people they don't know or even know a little bit. Um, I, I think we've got to be careful, but experiment, but be careful. Same with slow money. I mean, lending to a farmer that you don't know with all the great intentions in the world, you know, farming's hard. Farmers, and um, so it's a balancing act. Hi, John. Hi. Um, yeah, so I was wondering about the um, Bill McKibben's 350.org campaign for fossil fuel divestment, yeah. which I'm sure you've heard of. Yeah. So they've done a great job, of course, at getting uh, young people really engaged in these issues and uh, municipalities and divestment. But I'm wondering, apart from the kind of awareness raising value and the mobilization and getting young people radicalized, whether you think those kind of actions can actually start having an impact on that 22 a uh, trillion dollar carbon mm. bubble you mentioned earlier. Um, well, thanks for asking that. I, I, um, I, I, I can claim a little bit of credit that the, the 20 trillion dollar piece I wrote actually is what got McKibben locked onto this issue. So, you know, if I die tomorrow, I made some tiny contribution to, to it. And, and Bill's work is, is obviously fantastic. And, and I just have so much admiration for his commitment and sacrifice what he's doing um, for, for all of us. Um, I, I, um, I think divestment is a great way to cr create focus on this issue, but as an economic strategy, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, and I, I wrote a piece called um, Beyond Divestment. It's on, on the blog, and I actually wrote it about um, Swarthmore, where divestment actually started several years ago, and it's interesting. The president of Swarthmore is a is a former um, um, uh, religious scholar from Yale, and so it's kind of an interesting place to. So I wrote her a le I wrote her a letter, and I attached the paper. I haven't heard back from her yet, um, but uh, I think it's it's not. You know, divestment is, is a good first step. There's all kinds of issues about why and what are matters and whatnot. But the real issue is we need to become conscious about what we invest in. And certainly, you know, the institutions that, of higher learning that, whose values are completely aligned with the pursuit of 
you know, human well-being, um, there's this fundamental conflict and, uh, and yet when you're institutional scale, there's lots of things you can do with a portfolio, um, unlike what we can do in our 401ks. So um, uh, I, I, I'd refer you to the piece I wrote and, and see if it resonates. Um, but um, uh, but I think I think you know I think beginning with the endowments, um, the sovereign wealth funds, and the pension funds is where we really need to start. Um, we've got a new project that, uh, or new structure we're calling um, Evergreen Equity Split Model, which is essentially, you know, I, I, again, I don't, I don't want to go into this in, in detail, but imagine buying a coal company, taking it private, and liquidating it, and then working with a country or a group of philanthropists to liquidate it, not completely, but cut off the liquidation after five years. Um, I believe a lot of times the investors could actually get their capital back through the five-year liquidation, but you'd cut off the reinvestment of that cash flow into expansion. And so I think we need to kind of wrestle with proactive, intentional control situations to tackle the, the carbon issue. Um, and, and obviously combined with public policy, but, but investors can get started if they have the courage. Hi, I'm Stu McGregor from Canada. And I completely agree with the fact that we can't, the biggest thing that has to change is the ideo ideological change. That's, that's the crux of everything. And I was inspired by your comment that the cycles have sped up so fast that we're losing our ability to be resilient. Yeah. And yet we're all here trying to take action and we're, some people get frustrated with the small step actions realizing the ideological change is going to take years, yeah. decades. So I, what I do is I'm inspired by Ferrari's work on the pedagogy of hope. And, and I would like to suggest that as we take these small actions, you re bear in mind that despair will happen without hope. When you have hope, you can take action. Through action, you maintain your hope. So those small actions really matter while we're working on this massive long-term ideological change. Yeah. And that's kind of my takeaway from today. So thank you for that. Oh, good. <laughs> that's what I try to keep reminding myself. That's how emergence happens in nature. So I, I got no better ideas. So. <laughs> Hi, again, <clears throat> thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm Stephen Moore from the University of Texas. And you've made so far two, two references uh, to the regenerative design movement, I guess we can call it. And, and that really comes from John Tillman Lyle's work in the 80s and 90s and from Bob Berkebile's most recent work. But clearly, one of, the, well, one of the things they've already established is we know how to build net zero uh, energy environment, buildings and landscapes. So we know how to do that, but of course one of the reasons why we don't do more of it is a lack of investment, number one, and, and secondly, a lack of public policy that, that mm -hmm. might require others to do it. Uh, but of course we do know that it is more expensive, right? But of course on a longer, if you're not talking about simply tax policy of being able to depreciate your building over 20 years, um, you end up with a net zero gain after 40 or 50 or 60 years. Yep. So do you have some ideas about how investment uh, in public policy might be redirected so that we might have more regenerative design? Yeah. So the, we're all trapped in the IRR illusion, internal rate of return illusion, and we measure investments based on internal rates of return, which by definition are relative, you know, they, they value the near term over the long term, because the long term is discounted. Um, and, and then we don't value the non-monetary pieces. So I, there isn't a, I don't think there's an answer to solving that problem without shifting the, the ideology and the framework. You know, I was, I, I was encouraged, I just learned, there's a guy who's a very, very successful private equity honcho, um, who uh, undoubtedly is a multi-hundred millionaire uh, and he's starting at age 70 a new investment firm where he's completely um, rejecting the notion of IRR as an investment idea. 
and he's all about building good companies and he's he's intrigued with this conversation it's not going to be their core strategy sustainability but but I think you know I think we need to reject the idea that optimizing IRR is the goal of investing or we'll never address the, the issues you you mentioned um, maybe just a, a really short anecdote to, to translate this regenerative idea into corporate world just so that people have a better sense uh, you know I you know more about the built environment than I do and I, I think I think it's again the the you know what's the purpose of a corporation question that that we need to wrestle with and um, there's a guy called Peter Bakker who now runs the World Business Council for Sustainable Development I got it right which is kind of a group of large corporations wrestling with sustainability very impressive uh, group of people very intentional and Peter himself is you know remarkably he gets all this and more um, and he used to run the Dutch postal business uh, called TNT and while he was traveling <coughs> he, he was in he was in Africa and he said it was amazing I was 10 hours from my front door in Africa kneeling on the ground next to a little girl who was crying because her mother was dying of AIDS and it just hit him that you know I'm a CEO of a big company that's a beneficiary of globalization and yet 10 hours from my house this is reality and so he mobilized TNT which is think of it as the post office plus FedEx combined in Holland at the time um, and he said well we have assets we have people and we have logistics assets that we could bring to bear on the famine crisis so TNT partnered with I forget the name of the food world food program I think and they used their assets to um, become part of the relief support system for dealing with these famine crises and it cost TNT some money they depreciated their assets but he said it changed the spirit of our company um, and so to me that's an example of a regenerative idea um, he unlocked a potential in that company that was there all the time but hadn't yet manifested and and it changed the reason everyone went to work now the end of that story is that a couple of hedge funds got a hold of the stock and saw this wasteful activity um, well I should say it's not a great business to be the postal business is a hard business to be in because of the internet so there was earnings pressure and some some hedge funds got involved who were you know activist hedge funds and they split the company into two pieces and that may have had some logic to it but all of this stuff got you know I don't even think they they probably didn't even know about it but certainly it got thrown out the window and so uh, again our short-term myopic focus on financialization financial short-term financial quarterly objectives the hedge funds probably made some money owning the stock for three months or six months and sold it but the regenerative nature that was growing in that company was killed and um, and so it's a that, that's what I mean by so, so that was creating social capital if you will off balance sheet in a way that we just somehow need to find um, a way to, to empower companies to do that and and finance to support it rather than to crush it this has been a wonderful conversation um, I want to thank John for coming here, for speaking to us, and then for engaging in this dialogue. And John, I hope you'll be around for at least the coffee break and some of sure. the morning. People can chat with you at greater length. Yeah, and I'd love to take you up on the, the thought of how your group and our group can collaborate um, and, and come up with a better answer to your question than, than I was able to provide. So thanks very much. Great to be here. Thank you.